This is the story of Alive Again, my new short film. Before I go any further, I'll just flag that you can now watch this film through the link in the description. I highly recommend checking it out before going any further here. With that being said, on with the behind the scenes. The date is the 11th of July, 2023. I open my email inbox and see this. Dear Sean, we are delighted to inform you that you've been selected to participate in Fresh Film's Hothouse program. All the participants will be asked to submit a one-page treatment for their short film. A panel made up of industry experts and Fresh will choose eight treatments, and each will receive a 1,000 euro hothouse bursary to complete their short film. Kind regards, the Fresh Film Festival. Here is how my treatment looked. Cover page, summary page one, summary page two, character descriptions, themes and tone, target audience, and comparable media. This was my first time writing a treatment, and I must say I really enjoyed it. Not only does it assist you in refining and clarifying your vision, but it is also a key bargaining tool when bringing cast and crew on board your project further down the line. It also helps you fundraise, because on August 14th, I received this email from Fresh. Dear Sean, we are delighted to let you know that your application, Alive Again, has been successful. Get started writing your first draft. So I now had 1,000 euro, a solid short film treatment, and three months before the final cut of the short film was due. It was around this part of pre-production that I started looking for a producer, and I asked my friend Cal to pass on some names of producers that he would really recommend working with. One of them was Emily McGee, and Emily and I had actually reunited at a film festival back in May of 2023 after years of not seeing each other. And then Cal informed me that Emily was not only writing and directing short films, but she was actually producing them too. And so, the short of it is, I reached out to Emily and she, after a couple of voice messages, was absolutely down to produce Alive Again, which was such a blessing. And yeah, Alive Again had its producer. I wrote a first draft of the script in what felt like no time, before we refined and refined the material. Thankfully, the first draft clearly informed myself and Emily what we would need from a cast, crew, and location point of view. So, while the finer details of dialogue were being developed, pre-production was in full swing. I had the pleasure of sourcing some very talented friends within the camera department and hair and makeup department, while Emily worked on the AD sound and production teams. Simultaneously, we put out casting calls on social media, while also sending them to some acting agencies. For the roles of Ruth and Kelly, we received in and around 40 tapes. It took a lot of thinking and discussing, but before long, myself and Emily knew who our two actors would be. Now, we only needed two locations for shooting this short film, a house and a concert venue. For the house, I asked my girlfriend's parents if they would be willing to let a whole film crew into their house for two days, and thankfully, they were down. They were down with that, so very grateful for that. And then on the concert venue side, Emily sourced the most incredible location in Kilkenny by the name of Hole in the Wall. The people at the venue themselves were so kind, so cooperative, but the venue itself is also just, it, it adds so much to the film. Emily then worked on sourcing background actors for the concert venue scene while I worked with Claudia and Fiona, our Ruth and Kelly respectively, uh, in, you know, just talking through, talking through their characters. Then we needed a young Ruth. So we needed to cast someone who looks like Claudia, our Ruth, um, at a much younger age, around the age of seven or eight. Amelia Lily Cray literally just popped up, like on, on a casting website, she was just there. And uh, to this day, I, I think myself and Emily can't believe our luck uh, after, we cast, after we cast Claudia and after we needed a younger version of her, we can't believe our luck that Amelia Lily Cray kind of just was on our path of, of, of casting. The biggest challenge by far in pre-production was casting Root's dad within the film. Every actor that we thought would be perfect for the role was either on a hiatus from acting or unavailable. And um, it was honestly becoming a bit of a nightmare for us. We were getting really close to production and we still didn't have our, our, our David, our Root's dad. And thankfully at like the 11th hour, Shane Lynch came into the picture. His tape was perfect. He was available and he was, yeah, down to act in Alive Again. So we had our David, we had Root's dad and we were ready to shoot Alive Again. I hope that I will one day manage to shake this off, but something that I still struggle with in filmmaking is having the faith that all planned elements of production will actually come to life. The day before filming, a belief tends to slip into my head that production won't actually take place. The cast and crew surely won't show up 
and we surely won't be able to access our location. Rather than catastrophize the shoot, my subconscious seems to render it as merely imaginative. This causes for a great sense of disbelief when we get to the first shot. The actors are there, we're on location, camera and lights and sound are all set up. Somehow this vision that has been in my head for months has actually materialized. This is a feeling now so common that it almost acts as the starting gun for a production. The moment when it is time for the vision to properly become reality. Reflecting on the production, it was probably the most enjoyable shooting experience I've had. For most of my filmmaking journey so far, I've worked alone. When I first started out, that felt like a bragging right. But now I understand that it is far from such a thing. Running all elements of production can be very educational with regards to how the various roles in a film actually function, but in the long run, this lone wolf mentality will only hold you back, with the various production roles only acting as distractions from your primary focus, directing. So to have such a committed, knowledgeable, and cooperative team behind the camera, from Killian on sound, to our first AD Cleona, from our DP Kean and his brilliant camera and lighting team with Kira and Fiakra, to our PA Brian and hair and makeup artist Christina, my girlfriend, I had so much less to worry about. If I was to change anything about my directing on Alive Again, it would be my focus on the visuals. Now, fundamentally, I'm a very visual-leaning director, and so the quality of what's on screen will always be very important to me. But I do believe I'm still finding the right balance between directing visuals and directing actors. As a director, the people who need you most are the actors. Once you've sufficiently clarified your vision to your DP, the camera department can take the visual responsibility. The DP can be their guide. It is literally in the name director of photography. The actors, meanwhile, only have the director as their guide. The actors are the elements most directly translating script to screen. The quality of my work on a visual level is still something I take great pride in, and I don't imagine that will ever change. In fact, I really hope it doesn't but a better balance of focus definitely wouldn't hurt. Having had an intense and just slightly bumpy pre-production process, the production experience went by seamlessly. I was what I almost always am after finishing shooting a film, relieved. But beyond just that very simple recognition that we had done it, I genuinely felt immensely grateful for everyone who had contributed to the film. I'm sure that sounds like a copy and paste reflection, because everyone says that, but the reason I can look back on this film experience so fondly is because of the people who made it possible. And not only were they hardworking and in line with the film's vision, but they were kind. They were decent and warm and level-headed in their workflow. That was something which I used to take for granted, but if exposure to the world of the media industry has taught me anything, it is that that level of decency is precious and rare. If I'm ever in a position to cultivate an atmosphere on a feature film set or the likes in the future, this is precisely the atmosphere I would be pursuing. The post-production process on Alive Again was the same as it is for me on any film that I've done post-production on. At the beginning, it's wonderfully simple, very exciting, and before long, it is frustratingly tedious. And that is a natural evolution that I've come to expect with post-production. And actually, you know, coming to expect that tedious part of the process just makes it easier. Because I know it's going to come, and I know it's going to be so tough, and I know I'm going to be in the trenches thinking I will never finish this film, but I always do. And so I just kept that in mind on Alive Again. The first few drafts were simple, cut together the story, keep it as tight as possible, the difficult part of the process always comes when you're then polishing, because I think polishing is where, you know, the tedious part of the process is. That's where you're making the tiny minor changes. I really didn't make this part of the process uh, easier for myself because I was also sound mixing this film. And so while I was polishing the cut itself, I started to try and get a bit of a start on the actual sound mix, but I didn't do correct file management. Only on the fourth draft did I say to myself, this is going to be actually impossible to do a good sound mix on if I don't go all the way back to the beginning, basically, and rename all of my uh, rename all of my sound files, which I didn't do at the beginning, and I hated myself for not doing. But by the time that was done, editing became so much easier. I still had a lot of very frustrating technical difficulties from this point on that to this day make no sense to me of why they happened, but you know, the actual nature of uh, cutting together, um, you know, a cut that myself and Emily could be proud of, 
that was easier from this point on. And then came the very fun part of the process that I always love, which is sharing the drafts that I'm working with with a composer to see what their ideas are going to be on their end for music for the film. Myself and Will the composer emailed back and forth before having our big spotting call, where we went through the latest draft and forensically analyzed the scenes where the score would be active. From there, Will developed the various tracks in the film, and I genuinely could not be any happier with what he was able to compose. Having a solid cut of the film with a decent sound mix, rough grade, and nearly finished score, it was time to show the film to some people to gauge their reactions and see if there were any glaring misinterpretations that myself or Emily had been missing. As it turned out, there most definitely were. This draft of the film was leaving too much to the audience's imagination, causing them to fill in the gaps with elements that profoundly changed the meaning of the film. For example, a number of people thought Cal's character was Ruth's dead brother, which myself and Emily never could have assumed given our familiarity with the original story. This was fixable, thankfully, by changing the TV announcement to something more exaggerated and media-like, establishing Cal's character as a public figure. Up next on Stellar Stories, we have the brand new music documentary by Tom Gannon about up-and-coming singer-songwriter Paddy Kaiser. In this week's Stellar Story, we'll be speaking with yet another promising young artist, singer-songwriter Matthew Baker, as he talks about wanting to use his craft to make meaningful art. It was also fixable by removing the atmosphere of tragedy that had unintentionally developed within the film. Ruth's struggle is meant to be one of flat disappointment and discouragement, not one of tragedy. And yet, through the mix of a track within the score and some specific shots, an air of tragedy was being translated, which made the dead brother concept more viable. Removing this one track from the score, as well as a couple of shots, did exactly the job we were after. It developed an atmosphere of emptiness in Root's world, rather than one of deep sadness or sorrow. Making these changes, finishing the grade and sound mix, and having Fresh, the funders, review our final cut, saw us through to the end of post-production. Alive Again had been completed. In making films, my greatest fear is not failure. Rather, my greatest fear is no longer having something to say. My greatest fear is looking at my life, the lives of those around me, and the world as a whole, and not feeling stimulated to tell a story about what I'm seeing. Sometimes I can fall into a negative thought cycle of thinking that this is a fate I have already realized, that I have lost my inner child's voice, and that my mind has been too heavily influenced by the adult world for me to have anything original or unique to say. Alive Again proves to me that this is just a falsehood. I fear losing my inner child, and Alive Again tells a story that celebrates that quality in us all and proves how precious it really is. It tells a story of rediscovering that invaluable voice, feeling its warmth in its entirety and hoping to never let it go again. So if I ever do meet such a fate, there doesn't have to be anything to fear. As Ruth proves, as this production proved, that inner child can always become alive again. Mm -hmm.